Hi, this is Dr. Michelle Robin with Small Changes, Big Shifts, Building Rhythm and Resilience. And I believe if you'll change one thing a month, one thing for the next 12 months, you'll change your life forever. Thanks for joining me on the journey. Well, welcome back to Small Changes, Big Shifts, Building Rhythm and Resilience. Big shout out to my partners at Community America Credit Union and Advent Health for helping sponsor the show and get the word out about whole person health. Well, today I've got a special guest for you, like every week, but this one's Dr. Jeff Guskey. He's a medical doctor. He's a board certified emergency physician the past 35 years on the front line. Now he's on the front lines against COVID and doing some interesting things. Dr. Gusky is also a renowned National Ge Geographic photographer and explorer. His discoveries and photographs have been featured at the, 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 at the Smithsonian, say that five times, National Museum <laughs> of American History and Culture. And here's what I loved about your bio. When the power of modern world disappears, which it has a little bit, not really, but kind of this last eight months. And we have let all we have left is each other. Everything gets real at a heartbeat. We discover strength and courage. We didn't know we had, we connect to meaning purpose and to each other through selfless acts of courage and kindness. Tell me about that part of your bio. I want to get into the rest, but that's what really called my heart today. It's what I've seen on the front lines as an emergency physician, what we all have seen on moments like in moments like nine 11, or Hurricane Harvey, where in an instant, the power of the modern world disappears and we suddenly see human. Seeing human is being human. And we, we don't see race, gender, ethnicity, uh, you know, rich, poor, uh, educated, uneducated. We just see human. And complete strangers risk their lives to save the lives of complete strangers. And that's where these frontier moments are transformative. And I also have seen that as an explorer. Uh, I was the first fine art photographer to go behind the former Iron Curtain and document a hidden world of the Holocaust not long after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that journey has continued for the last 25 years. And, and so you discover that in times like what we're facing now, uh, the war is against the virus, but it could have been the Holocaust, you know, other wars. You see these unbelievable acts of human decency that bring you to tears. And, and I think that's what it's all about. You know, there's so many things to talk about just in your short bio, not even thinking about the questions I've prepared or, um, you know, the National Museum of African American History. You know, and um, I, I now remember I saw your picture before we did the show, but I was thinking, oh, I wonder why, why are you connected to African-American history? Um, can you dive into that a little bit for me? Yeah, I'd love to. So <laughs> everything I do, it seems to be associated with coincidence and with stumbling onto things, you know, almost by accident. But I've learned uh, that. Uh, these aren't coincidences that, that to pay attention to these small things. So um, I, I was uh, on assignment for the uh, New York Times doing a cover story for the Sunday travel section a number of years ago related to World War I. And I got stuck in the mud. And you've heard of World War I mud. I had a four-wheel drive and I, I literally got stuck in the mud. Uh, where the famous Sergeant York saga played out. And so long story short, I had to hike back into the, ne the nearest village. I don't speak French. Uh, it was in France. And the people that pulled me out spoke a little bit of broken English. And uh, at the end of the, of the, the problem, um, when this logging truck rescued me, uh, one of the guys said, hey, there is a place on the other side of the village where American soldiers were. But the owner is crazy. Uh, but if you get him on a good day, maybe he'll let us walk around. So the owner wasn't crazy. It was this beautiful 17th century French abbey that has been in the same family since the French Revolution, but it's falling in on itself now. They're embarrassed to let anyone in. And, uh, and so I was able to convince the owner to let me in. And on the top floor in the attic, were some inscriptions and that turned out to be, and it is the only remaining inscription of an African-American combat 
soldier that's or I'm sorry, soldier, World War One soldier that still exists today. And that led to a path of discovery about what that soldier's unit was all about and what the role of African Americans in World War One when there was so much racism. And uh, and and it turns out that one of the places that I had been photographing for two or three years at that point, uh, underground, uh, where I had established a great relationship with the farm family that owns it. Turns out that that, which is located in a different place, just by peeling back the layer on this inscription, led to us realizing that this other place was the only trace that it exists today of an original African-American combat unit. And uh, we knew it because the numbers of the, uh, the unit inscriptions that were carved into the walls of this underground command post were the 370th. So it gets better. So, it turned, so I get a meeting with the chief curator of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture before they open the doors of the new museum, which is a few blocks from the White House. It's the newest of the Smithsonian museums. And spectacular and if any of your listeners anyone in the audience if you're in dc you'll be amazed about the the museum it's it's just uplifting and and heartwarming and so we sit down he gave me this emergency meeting because it turns out that they were working on what would become this exhibit that i was in it was a how many like an 11 month exhibit or it closed in september um, and I'd found the only trace of the story they were working on, the only modern day trace. So they gave me this meeting and halfway through the meeting, Dr. Rex Ellis, the chief curator said, Jeff, and he, in this deep, rich, authoritative voice, he says, Jeff, you have stumbled onto, I have a dream before I have a dream. And then he said it again. Hmm. And he didn't tell me a lot about it, but he said it goes back decades and touches today. So it turns out this unit, it was almost like a mystical bridge across time because it's like these young men in this unit that were such patriots for America were calling out to us saying, we got race wrong, but this is a chance to get race right. Because who were they? They were the only all African-American unit in the entire US military with all black soldiers and all black officers. And 102 years ago, when they fought so patriotically for America, that unit had already been in existence for 49 years. Wow, that gives that gives me chills. Well, that's, that's a whole, you've got so many layers here. I, I, I wrote down a couple words, layers and curiosity. So I'm even more curious to hear more of your story. Um, I, this is a whole nother great story, but I want to get to some of your emergency medicine and COVID-19 because that timing is pretty, pretty uh, relevant right now. So is racism. You know, on this show, we'd like to celebrate Guide Connect, which provide hope. So we're celebrating you and your work. Thank you for being a frontline worker. Thank you for all the uh, stuff you're doing. Thank you for being curious. And, um, and I think that's what we have to do with patients and people. We have to be curious. And if we can be curious about, I wonder, I wonder why they eat the way they eat, or I wonder why they move the way they move, or I wonder why they think the way they do, that it'll bring some of the humanity. And, and what I also heard when you were telling the story about um, when we have uh, what's happening right now with COVID or 9-11 or the floods we've had is we, we strip off all the nonsense and we just look at human humanity. So, Tell me a little bit about your journey of being an emergency room physician prior to COVID. 35 years. I've always, ago. Loved, I've always loved rural emergency medicine. So I'm, I'm in Dallas right now, but I have a home in East Texas with a runway. And I, I went to, I intentionally uh, asked to, to do my first year of medical school in Alaska. I went to the University of Washington, but they had four campuses where the first year was held. And so um, I had the opportunity to go there with 10 kids in the class. And in Alaska, they use cars or I'm sorry, airplanes are like cars. You know, you 
<laughs> they're utilitarian because everything's so spread out. And I fell in love with flying and started um, uh, doing last minute scheduling coverage with my airplane, which was parked near the house. You know what I still have, I hardly ever go there these days. And, uh, and so I love rural emergency medicine and, uh, and the front lines and real people and you know ordinary Americans. There's so much nobility and wisdom in people who are living paycheck to paycheck on the front lines of life. They're often the most generous people. They're, they, they just have, there's a degree of, of humanity that inspired me tremendously. And so um, I, I, I uh, grew to uh, um, a mindset that goes to the very heart of what you were just talking about regarding the way we see, you know, curiosity. And as clinicians, the way we see things hidden in plain sight. So before I became an explorer in 1995, that was the the run up to the explorer mindset, because the difference between a really great ER doc in my view, and I'm sure this applies uh, in chiropractic or every area of medicine, um, and somebody who is is just in the middle of the road is is how they use the training. I mean, everybody's smart, everyone's well trained, everyone has this database of knowledge in their head. But where we fall down is when we fail to imagine little things that are hidden right in, in front of your eyes. Once you see them, you know exactly what to do, but it's, it's seeing them. It's, it's the questions you ask. It's a, an attitude of humility. And in a crisis, especially now, I believe we're in a fog of war. And this comes from my experience doing a lot of work related to war, World War I and World War II, the Holocaust. And, uh, and, and so the fog of war is when you're in an information desert, you, you're dealing with a lot of disinformation, fear, uncertainty. You don't know who to believe, a lot of manipulation and media. And, 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 and so this requires us to question everything and um and and to rely upon other human beings so when i was looking through uh the the prep notes for today's uh visit you know it seems like you're very tuned in to the little things you know you're clearly the name of your show it's and to me it is it you know what keeps us human what keeps us safe is is not being abstract in a world of ideas but in a world that's concrete where we keep our eyes wide open. So it, that goes to this discovery that I made, which is now on the cutting edge of COVID. Can I share a little bit about it? Sure. And you think, um, hang on, let me check in with my spirit here. I, I, I want to, I want people to hear that, but I wanted to talk first. What are you seeing? You know, here, you're the first person I've talked to that's actually been on the front lines um, as an ER doctor. I mean, I personally have talked to him, but not live on my show. Because there's the mixture. Some people think COVID doesn't exist. Some people are like, you know, really locked down in it. And some people are mediocre. What, what are you seeing? What, what are you, what's, what's the truth? Okay. I, it almost gives me chills to answer you, um, but I will. And I, I, I want to preface by saying that, that I, you know, as an ER doc, we're always, guiding patients and families on a journey through darkness to light towards hope, always towards hope. So right. there's a hopeful aspect to this story or else I wouldn't tell you, but, but the truth is that what is about, what is happening now is at the very, it's at the beginning of something that is horrific. It's horrific. And, and, and I say that for a specific reason, because, I uh, was fortunate to develop a technology on August 3rd called the Viral Safety Index, which was, it, it enables us to measure the enemy. What is the enemy with COVID? It is something called absolute humidity. 
which no one's ever heard of. We couldn't measure it. We couldn't see it. The virologists have known about it for years. The data has been there for years. The uh, virology community has known that humidity indoors is a non pharmaceutical antiviral. It's not, this is not controversial. It's all really that, clear. Say that again, just non. A non humidity is, and this, this is actually the title of a paper in 2018 by Mayo Clinic. It, it's for, uh, humidity is a non pharmaceutical antiviral. It is an antiviral agent. Okay, so it's a humidity good humidity in, indoors. Okay. So, so what? Because of this invention that I, I was fortunate to create with the cooperation of a, a tech company in Utah, we can now see viral danger indoors in the places where COVID spreads, and and I can also look back over the last 12 months since absolute humidity, this metric we've never heard of is seasonal. And with this data, I can look all over and have looked at cities all over America, north to south, east to west, your part of the country. And, 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 and so this enables one to know when COVID strikes, how bad and how long it's going to last within weeks. And, and so um, what, what is happening now, we're, we're just now getting into the thick of things, totally predictable. Europe was about a month to six weeks ahead of us as a bellwether. And, and I believe that we're looking at, uh, even with the vaccine, um, somewhere between a million and two million people that will not be with us by May that are alive today. Okay, that's darkness. Okay, I'll give you that. that. Is, it's real darkness. You said you're going to take us to light. So, so yeah. this is real. You're on the front lines. You're seeing it is real. Um, what, yeah, it's totally uh, real. The light. And Show it's me. Exploding. Yeah, Sorry? take me the light. Okay, here's the light, and and it's been there from the very beginning, and many people have not heard about it. Have, Michelle, did you know that hundreds of millions of people and entire nations have been immune? since the very beginning of the crisis? Have you heard this? No. Yeah, and, and a lot of people hear this and they say, what, you know, why haven't we been told? So uh, Thailand, 70 million people, last time I checked the numbers in the last five days or so, they had lost 60 people, six zero people since the beginning of the crisis. Mm -hmm. Taiwan, 23.8 million people seven deaths. And you look at nations um, like Bangladesh and Haiti amongst the poorest places on earth, their death rates are very, very, very low. They don't have social distancing, high tech medicine, money for healthcare, nothing, but they're immune. And they, they've all but been all but spared from the pandemic. Uh, the classic example is Hong Kong versus New York City, both sophisticated places, with about the same number of people all packed very closely together in the same size land mass. Last I checked uh, about five days ago, the uh, number of deaths in Hong Kong was 108 people compared to New York City, which has lost over 24,000 people. Hong Kong's death rate is 14 per million. New York City's was 28,000, I'm sorry, 2,850 per million. So 2850 versus 14, 24,000 versus uh, 108 deaths. So what distinguishes these places? It's absolute humidity indoors. And, and in these places, there are tropical climates and the ambient outdoor absolute humidity, not relative, throw relative out the window. Absolute humidity is simply the weight of water in the air. And, and so, the outdoor air makes the indoor air safer and it's it's antiviral it is um we have a different branch of the immune system uh that you may have heard of it's called cell mediated or innate immunity as opposed to acquired or adaptive immunity which is learned so the the, the herd immunity that we're all hearing about with regard to a vaccine 
is adaptive immunity where the body produces antibodies once it's exposed to an antigen or the virus or, or vaccine. And uh, the problem with that is that if there is a mutation, as happens every year with the flu, we have to get a new flu shot um, because the old, the, you know, the virus morphs, it, it mutates. Or if there is, um, uh, you know, if this is a bioweapon and there's another strain that's introduced, you know, the, the adaptive immunity doesn't work with new strains. Cell mediated immunity works on everything. It's not learned. It just needs to be turned on. And how is it turned on? By breathing air that has an absolute humidity of 10 or above. So the, the scientific data, which is very clear in many peer reviewed papers, shows that when the air you're breathing indoors is 10 or above, that's grams per meter cubed, that COVID mass spread all but disappears. The perfect example of this, and it's to me, it's crushing to, to learn about this, but it's hopeful that because this has been known, this is not, it's not hidden. I mean, the, so Japan and South Korea have amongst the lowest COVID rates. Last I looked, uh, South Korea had 10 per million death rate, Japan 15 per million. These are nations of like 51 million in the case of South Korea and 126.4 million with Japan. And they have been using absolute humidity since before the crisis. Why? Because humidity was known to be a non-pharmaceutical antiviral. So it's especially in their healthcare facilities, they've been doing this and they never got hit. They never had the nursing home uh, deaths and the, the horrific numbers. Wealth to me is uh, big family vacations. Houses, cars. Money, mostly, yeah. Am I wealthy? No, I wouldn't call myself wealthy. Did not have a lot of money, never really had a lot of money. Med school certainly isn't cheap. How'd you get this picture? <laughs> this is Molly. <laughs> it started pouring down rain and we hid under the tree. <laughs> I wake up in the morning and I see her smile and I know she's the love of my life. I think of her nonstop. She's just totally unbelievable. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. Hey, Mama. <laughs> that means she loves me. <laughs> Am I a wealthy guy? Absolutely. I may not have financial riches, but I am wealthy. And, and so here's where hope lies. And it, it's, it's something that we're doing right now. Everyone should look on the city of Roma, Texas, R-O-M-A, Roma, Texas. And we are right now uh, bringing about a role model healthcare initiative called Visualizing Hope, showing America how to reopen safely by going on offense against the virus. And here's what it is. It's simply making the indoor air safe like Hong Kong all the time. And it's not exotic, it's not expensive, it's not rocket science. In fact, if, if you go into places like Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, they've been doing this for a long time. They're doing it right now. Same with Love Field or the elegant Dallas North Park Mall. This is not exotic, it's just, it's, it's a safe range of humidity that's been known to be antiviral for a long time. So what Roma is doing is we've created a visual network of viral safety using viral safety index sensors. The viral safety index is a concept that I've pioneered and it is a colorimetric visualization of viral safety and danger. So you see little dots where there are sensors inside critical infrastructure. So right now, inside every school, every nursing home, the county jail, the hospital, uh, the adult daycare centers, uh, the city hall, the county courthouse, um, restaurants, retail, bus station, pharmacy, a funeral home, convenience store, 
uh, bank, you know, on and on. We're, we have a visual network. So imagine, this is so hopeful. Imagine mothers, before they put their kid on the bus to school, they look on their smartphone to see if their child's school is green, which means 10 or above. Okay. Isn't that cool? That, that is awesome. happening so, right now. So you, um, okay, so how, so now we've gone from darkness, light, hope. So we're, we're I'm, I'm all ears. And this show, I said, celebrate. We're celebrating you and your photography um, and your curiosity. And then now this new COVID thing, which I had no idea we we're going to talk about before today's show. Um, I want some guidance from you on how can the people that I get the opportunity to guide and serve, what can we do to put the odds in our favor? Very uh, simple. Okay. It's, it's so, you know, as somebody like here in Texas might say, it's stupid simple. <laughs> it's just really simple. It's so what you do is you, um, you make sure that your indoor air is between 55 and 65% around the clock. And that's very easy to do. And no worries about black mold. Mold is a myth, you know, at 65 and below. So it starts with something super expensive. One of these. They cost $12 <laughs> on okay. Amazon. Hey, Desiree, I hope you're getting this so you can put it in the comment section. So, so this is uh, it, this one is by Gobi. It's the one I recommend. I don't have any ties to the company because it's got a fast measurement time, like two seconds, and it's pretty accurate. And you see mine is 65. And hey, what's, it um, what's it called, Jeff? G-O-V-E-E. Gobi. G-O-V-E-E. -E. Okay. Yeah, it's a digital hygrometer. And I would buy extras. You can get them. Sometimes they run them on sale for like $10 or nine something. And carry one. Everyone should carry one with you at all times for every member of your family. And it's very important that you do not go in to interior spaces, meaning buildings, buses, trains. Airplanes are a different story. They're very safe, even though they're very dry. That's another discussion. But, but don't go into buildings that are below 50. You can go in for a moment, um, check to you know, do a reading. And if it's below 50, don't go in. That's where you get COVID. So the second thing you do is to humidify. And how do you do that? Many places, modern homes have HVAC systems that you just turn a dial. I have a friend who, um, he's a dentist in, uh, in the area of South Texas where Roma is. He's a dentist in Roma. His home had this system before COVID. And so he has one of these viral safety index sensors and he's always green. He just, his wife turns a dial, it's there, it's done. You, they don't have to add water, change filters or anything. It's just automatic. Uh, if you don't have that system and you want it, you can go on Amazon or talk to your local HVAC person. And you can put one in and they range, you know, the hardware is between about 250 and six or $700. Then you have to do some installation, simple plumbing and hardware. And then you can, you know, set it and forget it. Uh, it depends on your square footage. And then if you, if you don't uh, want to do that, and the least expensive way to solve the problem is what Roma, Texas is doing right now as we speak. They, like the school district ordered 150 of these whole home evaporative humidifiers, not ultrasonic, evaporative humidifiers. And the one I recommend, I have no connection to the company, is an AirCare MA1201. That's the best bang for the buck. They're $125, free shipping. Same. Um, and so we're capturing this, AirCare. AirCare, and it's the only manufacturer in the US, as it turns out, of evaporative whole home humidifiers. The MA1201. And uh, you set it on 65 and auto, and then forget about it. You need one for about every 1,000 or 1,200 square feet indoors. So if you've got a 3,000 square foot place, I would buy three of them. And you, you also buy a little bacteriostatic solution. The best buy is on Lowe's, uh, Lowe's online. And they sell Essic, which is the same as AirCare. It's a bacteriostatic solution. A quart is about $6. $6. 
you put a capful in the water when you fill it up and then you forget about it and you fill it every day or so and it'll keep your humidity in that safe range and then the third thing you do and you'll love this is vitamin d okay now it's not vitamin d like we hear about because doctors and i'm one of them we've always been oriented to vitamin d related to postmenopausal women and bone density and the lab ranges for vitamin d in that circumstance are 30 or even 20 you know and that's fine for bone density issues but with covid you need to be in the 55 to 65 range it's totally safe the upper limit is 100 and and you need to get tested it's critically important because you cannot you i'm sure you know this and you tell your patients you can't feel it i'm the perfect example may i just give you a little personal experience well first of all i want to tell you i had my vitamin d tested last week i should have my results tomorrow oh so great i tested twice a year um along with some other things and we actually um do we do blood work at i actually started doing blood work at my office because i was tired of people going to the to their doctor and not getting their vitamin d tested so thank you thank you so much for saying that and thank you for talking about the numbers because we've been talking about those numbers being uh at least 50 and above for about five years so great you know it's you know, it's, it's it, it's so frustrating because it's this none of this is secret um, you know, it's been known as an antiviral for a long time, but most doctors, at least, you know, medical doctors don't have a clue unless, it, you know, they're treating bone density issues. And with COVID, as it turns out, it, the data started to come out in mid-April from a number of very well-designed um, uh, studies from South Asian hospitals. And I've never heard of anything like this. If people were low on vitamin D, went into a hospital with COVID, they had up to a 96% chance of never coming out alive. And people of color are 82% likely to be low. Hispanic Americans, 70%. Can I just share something with you that's happening like right now? Well, you're, you're probably gonna hear it in the news. Go on, let's do it. So uh, in Roma, Roma is such a cool place. They're so courageous. It's the most Hispanic American county in the United States. And it's got a very amazing history, you know, that's, that's beautiful. And I, I did know about Roma because I did a book called Border Town, uh, The Odyssey of an American Place, about 12, 13 years ago, published by Yale. Uh, I co-authored it with uh, Dr. Ben Johnson. And, uh, but I found the story and, and I'm very close to the people there. And so we're pioneering visualizing hope, but guess what? We're going to, this week, we're going to be doing mass testing. The first, so we've created a pro, I've created a program called Get Started, Get Tested, Get Right, which is a pledge that businesses will sign. And um, the first signatories to the pledge are the city of Roma and the Roma Independent School District. And between the two, we will have about 1300 people that are hopefully this week going to get vitamin D tested. And what we expect will be that almost 100% of them will be deficient because they're already 70% deficient, but that's at lower limits in the 2030 range. And almost no one's gonna be at 55 and above. And what that's going to do is really startle people into the absolute necessity to urgently elevate the vitamin D levels. And we're going to be publishing online with the uh, cooperation of the doctors in Star County protocols for rapid titration of deficient people to get them into safe ranges quickly and keep them there. Okay, we've, we've got to have a discussion on this. You're my new best friend today, Jeff. Um, so a question. So first of all, um, to my team that's listening to this, um, let's, let's do something where we can do a vitamin D test for people um, and then actually help them with that, at least the supplementation. Jeff, we have them take vitamin D with K unless they're on blood thinners and some studies are saying that's okay. Um, are you doing the same thing, vitamin D with K? No, I, you know, I know I've heard a lot of people are doing that and I just don't, I, I've st focused my studies on vitamin D. Okay, and well, so I, I just have to claim ignorance about 
you know, I don't know enough to comment on vitamin K. Well, with I need the, to connect you, connect you with somebody. We'll give you some more. The functional medicine world's been talking about it for a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. About three years ago, I was with one of our lead researchers in the chiropractic profession, Dr. Dan Murphy, and I was at his seminar. And he's he's like he's like our top in our top one percent of uh, researchers. I can't even. He won't go on any shows because he doesn't want to be biased. He just I'm in the research. I'll tell you what the research says, and that's it. But if your vitamin D is 40 and above, you have a 70 percent chest line, less chance of cancer. So when right. that came out, I'm like, why are we not testing everybody? Um, so what I want to do team that's listening is to do testing and then, um, do a, a discount on our supplementation so people can actually get the supplementation as well. Um, I, I'm interested in your titration, but this is going to take us on a can of worms. So let's yeah. keep on going. So can I just I, share something with you that's startling. Yeah. It's good. It's hopeful. Okay, good. So guess what? Guess what? The, 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 the activation of cell mediated herd immunity now and i'll explain that in a second from humidity that's exactly what vitamin d does it does a lot of things but there are vitamin d receptors on the cells where the covid gets into the body and if there's not a vitamin d molecule on the vitamin d receptor the immune system is basically paralyzed against covid the cell mediated immunity so Cell mediated immunity is so important uh, because it, it kills everything. It'll kill mutations. It'll kill new versions of COVID, uh, not kills, but it, 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 it protects the body with, you know, these the natural cell mediated immunity. Um, I said, and I sorry, we become Teflon where COVID can't get in our bodies because there's nothing for it to get to. Well, it's, it's, it's that, and it's, it's, um, it's a combination. There, there are like, you know, probably more, it would probably take hours to explain it all. And I don't understand. I know that, you know, there's, there's the mucociliary transport, there's the um, goblet cells and mucin, and then there's activation of interferon based signaling proteins that uh, induce hundreds of genes that, that take out the virus and more. And, and vitamin D is important to activate, turn on, this immunity. Now, here's what's really cool. So we've heard about herd immunity. What is herd immunity? It's when enough people are immune that the virus can't spread like wildfire through a population. So COVID only spreads indoors, mass spread. It's, a, it's because uh, you have to have two things, virus and vulnerability. So the virus has to be in the form of a cloud, which is aerosol, which is submicron particles. Outdoors, aerosol dissipates immediately. You walk into a cloud of virus, breathe it for long enough. When the absolute humidity is below 10, that's where you get COVID. If you have safe levels of vitamin D and you're breathing safe air, you are very much safer against COVID. So here's the herd immunity concept. Herd immunity, cell-mediated herd immunity is when everyone inside a building is immune at the same time because they're breathing the same air. And they have it's adequate humidity. The adequate, well, it, the, the humidity turns on the, the cell mediated herd immunity. And if we, one of the things that is going to be a breakthrough about Roma is it's the first time to my knowledge where anyone has created a, uh, an environment where people have, uh, they're breathing safe air and they're, uh, vitamin D levels are in the safe range and it, it could actually knock this baby out. I mean, we can, what, what I believe we'll see is COVID mass spread plummet and like probably go to next to nothing while the country is, is blowing up and no one knows why, because they don't have the model right. And once you understand that COVID is spread by aerosols, not micro droplets, not fomites, what would it mean? Can I just explain the model really quick? Uh, yes. And then I want to I want to shift just a smidge. But so explain. Okay. That, um, and I want to tell people that are listening, Troy, Penny, thanks for your comments. If you have a question for Dr. Jeff, the show is going to be a little long today, just so you all know, but I will wrap it up here in the next 10 minutes. But if you have a question, now's the time to ask it. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. So we, we have three modes, three modes of spread with viruses. One is, uh, is fomites, which are surfaces, like Ebola is principally spread with surfaces. Um, and then you have micro droplets. Flu is probably more of a micro droplet spread. That's, 
micro droplets, they're invisible like aerosols, but, but they're comparing a Mack truck to a gnat. You know, the size is, is night and day. Micro droplets have mass, inertia, velocity. It's like throwing a baseball from one person to another. And, and a mask is like having a baseball glove where you catch the micro droplet. A protective barrier is, um, is also able to block micro droplets from getting one person to another. If you social distance, uh, you can get far enough away and it really takes like 30 feet to get far enough away um, because the micro droplet will be pulled to the ground by gravity. Um, uh, aerosols do not obey the laws of gravity. They are a cloud, they float. They go hundreds of feet across a room. They can go, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of feet. They can go down halls. They can go around corners. They can go through the ventilation system from floor to floor inside a building. They can last for days. The person that brought that virus into a room may have left 10 hours ago. And the people that get COVID go into the cloud of virus, breathe it. And that person is nowhere to be found. It's not person to person directly that COVID spreads. It's, it's aerosol and you cannot block aerosols with a mask. It's like trying to stop a gnat with a chain link fence. You can't use protective barriers. You can't social distance. They, none of those rules. That's why Europe exploded. No one saw it coming in eight weeks, starting September 1st, 30 countries blew through to all time highs. And that's what's happened in the United States and what's going to keep happening. So th those are the two models and it's aerosols, I believe, which explain why uh, COVID is blowing up. And the only way to protect ourselves, we cannot sterilize buildings. You can't do gadgets, re-engineering, ventilation, cleaning things. None of that works with aerosols. The only thing you can do is lower human susceptibility. In other words, make yourself invulnerable or relatively invulnerable to the virus through natural protective barriers and, 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 and the immune, natural herd immunity. Um, by humidity and vitamin D. That's it. Well, I want to tell you, um, and, and Deanna, I agree with you. There's lots of info here, but the key takeaways, um, we're in some darkness. There is light and we're going to have hope, which is what this show's about. Thanks again to our sponsors, Advent Health and Community America for being community leaders on this. Um, Jeff, I want to have a post conversation with you. So um, I know I'm going to get a thermometer as soon as I'm off this call. Um, I had my vitamin D check last week. I'm going to call my uh, HV guy and get my humidity checked and hear it at my office. Um, you, have, First of all, I have to tell you, nothing on my notes say we're talking about what we just talked about, um, but it was such a full conversation. Um, I'm so grateful you took time to share. Likewise. Thank you. Um, so, so grateful. You know, I've got um, just a couple of closing questions that I want to share with you. And um, whoa. This has just been so great. Um, if you had a magic wand, I guess you'd probably make sure everybody had the right humidity level. If you humidity had a and D. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you had a magic wand, that's probably, I'm going to guess that's what you do. Um, what's the medicine you share with the world, Jeff? Dr. Jeff, what's the medicine? You're you share? Recovering our, our humanness. It's, it's, it's seeing human as being human. It's, it's about the little things that you do every day to make other people feel safe and feel human. It's the, you know, the unacknowledged grace and decency and opening a door, or holding an elevator for someone or remembering their name, tiny acts of kindness. That is the key to getting through hard times. Well, we just finished a 31 day of kindness. We're in 40 days of gratitude right now. It's another series I'm doing. And so um, I have no idea how we got connected, but I'm grateful for the connection today. It definitely has been uh, well worth it. I can hear the people going, how do we find people like this? It's just so great. Okay, I'm gonna pick a quote for you today. I've not done one yet. And here's a quote for you today. Um, oh, this is perfect as an ER doctor. This is by Billie Jean King. Pressure, pressure is a privilege. It only comes to those who earn it. Well, Jeff, you sure have earned being on the show today and all the great things you've given us and our listeners. Thank you, Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank um, you. God bless you and keep up the great work. And I God like bless you and, and your audience. Well, we're going to have fun. All right, everybody. Have a great week. I'll chat with you very soon.
If you've not joined, if you've not signed up for the Small Changes Big Shifts Gratitude Campaign, uh, 40 Days of Gratitude, I'd encourage you to do that. Small Changes Big Shifts backslash gratitude. It has been a ton of fun. Um, I think we're on day uh, 30-ish. I feel free to join us. All right. Blessings to all of you. I sure appreciate you listening to Small Changes Big Shifts. If you go to the website, smallchangesbigshifts.com, we'll have the show notes ready for you there. If this episode inspired you to make a small change that will lead to a big shift, please share with a friend. You can catch our episode on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and our website. And if you feel like it, please leave a rating or a comment. Be sure to subscribe so you can catch our episode next week. Blessings to you.